Hey guys, just a reminder, this is not official medical advice or such. Please seek an appointment with a licensed medical provider. Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of Dive Into Diet on Performance Medicine TV. I'm with the star of the show, nutrition coach Lucas Schmidt. Lucas, what's going on, man? We're going to talk about something experimental today. You, you told me before we hit record that uh, you might mention some words that I have trouble pronouncing. Uh, I'm not going <laughs> to lie. Have, I'll, I'll have trouble pronouncing <laughs> them too, so don't worry. Uh, so we're, we're talking about serapeptase today. Yes, serapeptase. And I've heard think, of it. I, I've heard I of think it. Robin has – has Robin done anything on this before? I know it's been mentioned on Explain This uh, yeah. maybe even a couple times, but I don't think we've done a, a dedicated episode to Sarah Peptase. Okay. Yeah, um, I think I saw her. Maybe I think yeah. it was her. Uh, it sounds like something she would be well-versed on. So Yeah, um, she's definitely talked about it. So I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm vaguely clued in. Okay. Uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm interested to hear what you say about it. Some of, some of the uses you're seeing, uh, with your clients. So, well, I will say being, as I said, it's experimental. I have not personally suggested it to anyone because be, it's more of a topic of interest for me. And I think if anybody watches this, hopefully they'll go read up on it themselves. Oh, nice. I found it fascinating, but I might be the only one. So apologies in advance if this is like mind numbing to you, whoever's listening. Um, <laughs> I think it's super interesting. And part of the reason, though, is just where it comes from, where it was discovered. So I'm going to give you that first. It's a uh, proteolytic enzyme. So I've written some notes because here comes some of these uh, fancy pants words for you. Um, it's produced by entobacterium. So it's just a strain of bacteria. Um, and the name of the endobacterium is Serratia marcescens. Serratia marcescens. Okay. Okay. So where was that discovered? It was discovered in the end. <laughs> and here's the thing. How did we discover this? I don't know. Or why we discovered it? I know how we discovered it. I don't know why. And here's what, what, do you mean, what I mean by that. It is found in the intestines of the silkworm. <laughs> this is like... Let me theor I'm going to theory craft here. Why would somebody care about the intestines of a silkworm, you might ask? Maybe because silk is a very valuable and sought-after substance. It has been for thousands of years in clothing making. Silk is incredibly valuable. There's a whole trade route from Asia called the Silk Road. Mm. Have you heard of Silk Road? I have, yes. It's the I think it's the largest land trade route in history, maybe. I, I could be wrong there, but it's one of them. It stretches from... Siberia through Mongol and Mongolia, all the way to Poland, essentially to Europe. So huge, huge trade route. And silk is in the name, so it's got it's very important. Silk is produced by silkworms. Okay, that's my theory as to why it's been, why their intestines have been studied. Maybe scientists wanted to figure out how they make it. Silk is a, you know, it's a valuable substance. Anyway. But what is it for um, in the silkworm? The silkworm uses this enzyme to digest and break down certain proteins. Why would they do that? It's to escape their cocoon. Okay. They secrete this substance that the bacteria in their intestines make, their little bitty intestines, um, to eat through the protein structure of the cocoon so they can escape and emerge evolved or changed, metamorphosized, metamorphosized. I don't know what that, I don't know what, you know, metamorphosis, you know what I mean. So that's where it comes from. Now, if you bought a supplement of, of this serapeptase, are you, you're not consuming silkworm bacterial secretions. Like any supplement that comes from bacteria, especially now it can be grown in a lab. They just grow the bacteria in a Petri dish and then extract the the, you know, we're not milking silkworms. <laughs> right, right. We don't have a million silkworms hanging from strings in labs that we're squeezing. <laughs> it's an interesting visual image. <laughs> um, so what's the what's the hullabaloo? Like, why am I interested in it? Um, so because it's a um, pr proteolytic means it can cleave peptide bonds, <laughs> break them up. Now, that could sound bad. I don't want to break up my peptide bonds, my proteins. I might break... No. It's certain protein bonds that you don't want too much of. Okay? Um, you've heard of spike proteins? Yep. 
inflammatory yep. proteins. Yep. So we need those. We need infl- people. I think inflammation gets a bad rap. People think, oh, I've got inflammation, chronic inflammation, inflammation here, inflammation swelling. It gets a bad rep for good reason because it hurts generally. But inflammation is an essential function in our bodies. We need inflammation sometimes. What the problem with inflammation currently that the society is facing is this chronic inflammation, meaning for some reason that function isn't shutting off in all of us when it should. So we have perpetual swelling and perpetual um, in, like inflammatory pain and things like that. That's the problem. Um, but, you know, when you sprain your ankle, you need inflammation to heal it. That's why it's swell. Your, your ankle, your body puffs it up so it can't move. It immobilizes the joint so it can stabilize it and start working on fixing it. So inflammation serves a purpose. But when things stay inflamed too long, then it inhibits healing and things like that. So that's, that's really a, a sort of a tangent. But I just wanted to mention that. So in that regard, it's experimental but it's been shown in certain studies to help with pain caused by inflammation, reduce swelling, and specifically reduce swelling in nasal passages, um, which can help with allergies, and it can reduce inflammatory spike proteins. So so, so what I'm hearing is it, it, it reduces inflammation. Is Yes, yeah, acute inflammation. You know, acute. acute meaning like really concentrated, but like people who have chronic nasal swelling from allergies, just you know, constantly it gets, it can be a real annoyance and hindrance yeah. to your functionality, especially if you use your voice a lot, like teaching or singing. Um, so people are experimenting with serapeptase to lower that, and anecdotally, meaning you could find um, lots of forums which are unreliable, to be honest, but. I'm not one that discredits anecdotal evidence. You know, people saying personal experience. That's what anecdotal means. If I, Lucas Schmidt, say, yeah, I took serapeptase and my nasal swelling went down in four days. That's an anecdotal account. I'm giving you an anecdote of what happened. Um, the, the issue with anecdotal evidence is that it's, it's personal. It's individualized. And so it's really hard to track it and, and verify it. That's all. <laughs> but I don't throw it out the window. Right. Um, there's a ton of anecdotal evidence that it helps with allergies, um, nasal swelling, um, and just general pain, things like that. But that does not qualify for therapeutic or pharmaceutical use just yet. So I do want to say that. It's not a pharmaceutically approved substance yet. Okay. It's not a li- it's easy to get. You don't need a prescription. You can go on Amazon and buy serapeptase, just like any other supplement generally. It's not regulated. Um, it also is being – this is the, the cool part about it that to me is very interesting. It's being researched now and has been for a few years for its antimicrobial, um, so anti-infection properties. Mm. And it's being studied to – they're trying to see – they've seen evidence, otherwise they wouldn't be exploring it further – that if it's taken with an antibiotic, it improves the functionality of the antibiotic. So it's like an enhancer. So, so you take you have like a bacterial infection, and you take I don't know um, penicillin. You know, I, I don't know that penicillin's been studied with. I'm just that's the most common antibiotic I can think of. In theory, serapeptase would enhance its function. Which why would that be interesting? Well, you know we're people. Apparently, the pharmaceutical industry is running into a problem of people becoming resistant to antibiotics. So they're not working as well as they used to on, on pathogens. So this could be a possible way to get around that. That's now, that interesting. That is highly experimental and not something – if you get strep throat, don't think, I'll just take serapeptase. It'll go away. Uh, no, that's not what I'm saying. <laughs> you could ask your doctor, though. Maybe they're versed in it. Hey, if I take serapeptase with my antibiotic, will that help? You know, that's what it's being studied for. So that's all the info I've got on it. Um, why there are cautions. The one caution I saw, because it cleaves protein bonds, it can have a similar effect to blood thinning. Okay. Um, it's okay. also exper- because of that. It's experimental in uh, breaking up blood clots. 
but you would want to be careful if you're on like blood pressure medicine or anything like blood that. Blood thinner, yeah, yeah. or aspirin. Okay. High, uh, lo- I don't know that baby aspirin is going to mess with you, but anything higher than that, even still, you should tell your doctor you're going to look at yeah. serapeptase, particularly for that that reason. That is the prime. You've got to tell your doctor. I want to experiment with serapeptase. Serapeptase, supplementary wise, does not survive the stomach acid, so you have to get one. Um, there's a particular capsule, and I wish I had written the name down. It's common. It's a capsule that can survive the stomach acid short term and get into your small intestine. There's other supplements that need these kind of capsules. Um, another thing that it's recommended is when you take it, you want to take it with at least 8 to 16 ounces of water to dilute your stomach acid for a few minutes so the pill can survive and get through. Interesting. Yeah. So there is, there's a lot of strategy around you know, making empty stomach, it. Empty stomach, chug a ton of water, then take the pill. Okay. Yeah. That's, the, so, that's the recommended way to take it. So it is is it is in capsule form. Mm-hmm. Uh, any dosage dosages that you like, or not yeah. that you like, just what are the what what are people doing? I actually didn't write this down because it doesn't follow the standard dosing protocol. I will tell you a common. It has its own own individualized dosing measurement. It's international serapeptase units. <laughs> it's the one I've seen most common is between fifty thousand. Serapeptase units and 120,000 serapeptase units. They will be listed on the supplement. That's so interesting. The one I have and I'm taking experimentally is 120,000 serapeptase units per per dose. It's one pill. Are you taking? Are you taking it out of curiosity for? Because you know, obviously, you sing for my dance. sinuses. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And just to see what happens on inflammation. So, man, keep keep us posted on that. I'm I'm very yeah. interested, especially. You know, I would imagine it'd be really helpful in out peak allergy season, mm-hmm. um, even heading into you know the colder months. Yeah, I I have seen improvements. I had a weird outbreak of just chronic post nasal drip. I don't normally have allergies. This whole summer into fall, I've had it, and I can't speak to its pure efficacy because I'm also taking flonase. So mm. um, right. I have seen improvement. What I will say as odd, and this is probably totally up in here, okay? I'm going to warn everybody, totally up in here. The day I started taking it, the day before, or excuse me, the night before, I was squatting at the gym and had a mild stinging pain in the front of my knee. Very mild, but enough to be annoying and kind of painful. And the next day I noticed when I tried to lock my knee or straighten it, it would kind of, oh, oh, it would sting and hurt. Nothing like a tear or anything, you know, nothing severe. I figured it'd go away in a few days. I took serapeptase, and in two hours, the pain was gone. Now, that, that's interesting. could I have just worked through the stiffness? Maybe. But I did notice that. It was very distinct, like, oh, all of a sudden, my knee is fine. I I don't know. I, <laughs> I'm skeptical, but... Hey, I like to be a believer in that, so... That's so cool, man. Well, serapeptase... Uh, Super interesting topic. I'm sure, Lucas, this won't be uh, the only episode we do on this. We'll probably, one, I, I want to follow up to see kind of how it how it's uh, helping with your uh, sinuses uh, here in a couple of months. Yeah. Um, but but that's awesome. Is there any anything else you want to uh, cover in regards to serapeptase? No, I think it covers it. All right, man. Thanks so much for jumping on. Thank you. Don't go away.